and it research on origins of life and talk with them and do research with them and then start to talk about them, the artificial stuff. I have a fight with her. F finally, I won. She dies, For unfortunately, because she's, she's, she was sick. But the idea, it's, I, I understand, there, there was something there with the biologists. It's like, a, oh, I do biology, but I don't really interested in artificial stuff. But there is nothing real artificial. Um, the thing is actually, my main uh, primary things in my life was electronics. I don't do the Arduino stuff. I use another technology from another company. They launch pads, more cheaper, and they can use piezoelectrics to power them. And they use micro amperes, so I recommend them. OK, that's the electronic parts. That's some of the robots I made in my kitchen. Uh, you know, I, I do electronics in my kitchen also, uh, with ironing and all this stuff with this uh, thing like this. And this is the thermocycle. I have uh, my open PCR stuff, but I hack it. I make a new design and upload to the website. Uh, it's more efficient now. And the new version they are selling is the one of the versions I upload to the WebKit. So um, this is the electronic part. But this going into the same stuff. Electronics with biology. Biology, the next one. Uh, somebody here was talking about the glowing things, right? Over there. OK, this is all the glowing organisms we have. It's a poster. Uh, you need the poster I can give you the PDF. Um, but OK. Electronics. Now we have biology, and I am learning biology right now. And I started to under work in biology, how the things glow, what are the genes inside when they make glow. And the third passion, it's computers. This is my rig, my studio. I make electronics music, um, sometimes video, DNA synthesizing there. So I have these main squares, and everything goes in the same way. Open source. I was working I'm, in 1993. I made a Slackware 2 version, and I started with the Linux Foundation. Uh, I really like the idea to have something, something really for free. You can hack. You can do anything you want, and it's yours. And the best thing is, is this a whole community that you can share technology. Um, so, in the part in, bi in biology, going there, what, what's going on here? from the biodiversity came from the complexity from atoms to molecules, cellular tissues, organ, habitats, population, communities, ecosystem, planet, and the cosmos. We have two perspectives in science, reductionism, which is going from the top down, going inside to the atoms, and then from the bottom up is from the atoms to the level. So we, we are going to, um, when we are looking for the solution in a problem, we go in this direction, so we find um, the middle uh, and the solution. So, what's going with living things? There are a lot of things, living things, and the evolution of living things leads to this complexity. This is the tree of life. We are over here, uh, over there. Uh, humans are here. Uh, this is all the living organisms we have sequenced, and now we are start to understand. We are not uh, unique. There are a lot of amazing things over there. Um, for example, how the DNA works, how the, the DNA goes into a protein and produce an information or produce a function. Then, uh, you know, evolution gives those uh, machineries. Actually, we are machines. Uh, living things, we are, not, uh, we are computational living machines. This is, when, you, when we see this, we see a motor with a stator and electronics. It's the same stuff. We can model living organisms like a robot. Uh, actually, we do that. Um, so uh, what's going with the biology right now? Uh, we understand that uh, many people in the 70s, they believe that gen genetics was leading the things in biology, the information. But it's not only the genetics. We have a lot of different information going there. We have the genomics is the genetics, then we have Transcriptomics is from the uh, DNA to the proteins. There are a lot, another uh, level of information. It's uh, proteomics is the study of the relation of the proteins. OK, this, this is going far. This is not only the gene. They're going far. Uh, then we have also the metabolomics, the interaction of the enzymes and the metabolism inside the cell, the lipidomics, glycomics, and also 
metagenomics. It's the relation of the genomes of all the species. We are not humans. We are uh, Homo sapiens, Escherichia coli, uh, Staphylococcus aureus. We are a garden of life, interacting each other, sharing information, DNA, and all this stuff. So this is going into um, a complex thing. Um, how this looks like this, OK, this is a protein. This is how we st study the proteins in biology. Uh, this is a green fluorescent protein, actually one of the mutations we have in my laboratory. This is the letters of the protein. Um, what we are going to do, this is a, a small experiment right here. It's OK. I want to take this protein from the glowing organism. I want to put into another organism. And we have a lot of processes. First, let me show you this. You want to know how the cells work? This is the known pathways. Right in, this is the map inside the cell. OK? OK, I have my gene. What do I have to do with this gene? I have to cut the gene from the chromosome inside the cell. So I take the, the, the DNA. I have molecular enzymes that actually take down. I can look for this region I'm looking for. They take down the DNA. Uh, I have this molecule. In this case, you, I can replace this DNA or take the DNA from there. Then, uh, with other molecule enzymes, cut it down, put it together, and I can put the gene there in the DNA. So th that's, that's really ch easy. We have molecular cut and paste stuff. And it's really f easy to do because I only have to put some stuff uh, with some minutes, and then you have your DN new DNA sequence. Um, this is the basic molecular biology. We are dealing molecule, uh, the, the basics of, of life, but in a way that is actually completely, uh, you know, we have to do a complete gene. We have to do, uh, it's, it was impossible to share this information with other people. They have to do the same stuff there. Um, in 2004, the uh, uh, MIT has uh, this idea. People at the MIT has this, this idea of engineering idea that why we don't make a standard part. The, OK, I can share. I can send this to uh, another person. But they, he said, OK, I want to put this in a plant. I have to make all the things together, maybe two years, three years to make the things. So at the end, they choose, OK. We have computers, right? And the computers are made from electron, basic electronics. They make gates. They make model use, computers, and networks. So why we don't do the same stuff with biology? We have proteins and genes, biochemical reaction, pathways, cells, and cells and uh, cultures and tissues. So then decide to make the IGM, International Genetic Engineer Machine Competition, in which they propose to the people Life is too complex to make a standardized part so you can put it together like a Lego, or uh, it's more easy to do that like that. So what we do now um, is to take a standardized vectors. It's the how we transfer or put information inside the cells. Redesign, we design the behavior of the cell. Reprogram the whole metabolism of the cells. It's this is going inside the cell. Reprogram all the cells, and okay, I want I can make this back this cell or bacteria uh, produce aromatic polyketides. I can we can make uh, um, uh, bacteria that smell like uh, um, banana, mint. Uh, we can produce fuel cells, biofuels, bioplastics. Just only all do, doing all these things. The, 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 the best amazing idea is we have now a biological Lego. And we propose it to the, OK, the other part is, OK, we were working with this marvelous technology. We are sharing DNA. And we, are, we were aware that actually not all the people who has, has enough money or to pay from the software and to pay for the, for the technology. So we, we started the idea, why we don't make it open source? The thing is actually uh, to cost to process genome until now cost nothing right now thirty one cents. So all the prices to make the DNA synthesizing goes low. Um, the open source stuff uh, comes here. Uh, 
Uh, now when the people is able to download the information from the computer, pay it $100 and they get the genome into the house and they can make a lot of stuff with them. And this is an open source version of DNA technology. Uh, this is what we call the internet, uh, the IGM gives all these plates, all these uh, small points you see here, there are uh, genes that you can mix together inside in pipettes and you can make your own experiments to synthesize uh, artificial chromosomes for bacteria. We have the, these uh, wells here are the vectors where we can infect the bacteria and we have a set of basic bacteria to start the culture. Um, this technology actually is really cheap. You can only you only have to pay two thousand dollars, and you get all this project for years of years of uh, uh, happiness, because it's uh, yeah you know this technology actually in two thousand cost one million dollars. Now you pay two thousand dollars, and you get all these one thousand uh, genes that you can put together and play with them. OK, the idea here is um, I came to propose to the people at Pixel, um, we can make this here. We uh, International Genetic, and we are at, at the IGM, uh, every year go there and propose different uh, prospects for the next uh, seasons. And the, this year, they, they started the, the art uh, season. Uh, there is no international group working there. There are always universities, and mo now there are private companies starting to work in there. So one of the proposals uh, at this pixel is we can start to work with this uh, 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 together. Interna and a real international institute, pixel institute, can go there the next year at the IG IGM, and we can present something with these guys. Um, one of the things that I made before in synthetic biology is uh, how uh, Turing patterns actually are dots. Um, this is how the dots appear in the skins of many animals. So this is my expertise. I know how to do, and I can, we can work together how to do all the things. Uh, in the web, and you can check the website also. Uh, one of the things that we made there in the project in Mexico was uh, to simulate the patterns of the skins in the in the animals. This is our us there in the Boston MIT having a great fun after getting drunk there. <laughs> and after that, we come back to Mexico to take down the gene uh, from artificial uh, the glowing gene from the glowing bacteria. My friends and I went to the beach. This is the first uh, do-it-yourself thing we made there at the university because we went to this place. We found this place is full of this bacteria called vibrophosphorin. It's really easy to grow. And you can take the, uh, the water there. You can grow the bacteria there. And you can control the light with the bacteria. Um, this is uh, in, in the night. It, this is a small fluorescence from this. Even with the light there uh, from the light, you can see the fluorescence from the, from the beach. This is, uh, we started to make these uh, small uh, samples from there. This is one of my friends taking the samples from the fishes. Uh, this is the bacteria. A really easy to grow on Vibrio bacteria that can uh, close, it. you can put into your glass and you can read a book for all night, just giving sugar. <laughs> so later with this experiment, I take, the, I take the whole gene and produce a new bacteria that is this one. This is an uh, enhanced version of the bacteria that actually works better. And you can read books and watch TV. Uh, you can do a lot of things, actually, with this one. Uh, I, can, uh, I made the test with my friends there at the house with one of the legs. And you can stay in the whole living room with one of these uh, petri dishes. It's a mutation, a directed mutation. Everything is made with open source software. Python, R, C++, Linux, text code. It's everything on, on, on open, source, open source stuff. Then, the 2010, the other, uh, we get another prize for this project. It was a very cool E. coli. Uh, there is a, a bacteria that actually senses the cold. 
it has an artificial sensor of cold, and then produce an antifreeze protein. This protein has a feature that when you it goes into the protects the tissue from freezing. So uh, the, the, the beginning of the idea is like, you know, it's difficult to live alone and you have to freeze uh, the most little stuff. And when you free on frost, the, the thing they got not so really good taste and the stuff. I would say, okay, why we don't use a protein? Um, there are a lot of uh, mechanisms in many organisms that actually protect them from the freezing. And uh, put it back in the uh, artificial gene. So then I realized, okay, we had another problem. Organs and tissues are difficult or impossible to to freeze. So then uh, the next step to do this protein is a artificial protein that actually, when the te the temperature rises over 30 degrees, destroys itself, the natural itself, and there is no traces of the of the protein. So. It, we, I started to take it. Uh, one of the genes that the, the cells has and sense the, the, the cold, and put with this guy. This is the donor of the pro antifreeze protein. It's from the North America. And uh, this guy actually can f you can freeze it in blocks of ice, and you can defreeze it, and he works. He, he uh, uh, goes around. And this is the proteins we uh, we started to work of the um, pro antifreeze protein. There is actually a, a chimeric protein. It's many organisms that are in this protein are actually, um, the, the most difficult part is the uh, thing when you reach a certain temperature, it breaks down. Because uh, one of the important things is don't, don't um, leave traces of the proteins or the things you put into the t or tissues because maybe can kill the host. So you'd have to break it down really easily. And the protein actually at 30 degrees, we are working at 37, 36 degrees. So there is no trace of the protein until the organs gone implanted. Um, th that was made in this robot. This is a, a technology robot that actually makes all the experiment by myself. I just programmed it. I, we hack it. Now it's running Python. And now it's open source because this robot cost $25 million. And the thing is actually, can we make the, the open source version? We can, but I need help. So there is another thing we can do here at the Pixel, the robot that do DNA technology, we can make it here. Gino. And for all these things, I got invited to go at the International Center of Theoretical Physics. Um, to present uh, projects there in open source technology. Now the UNESCO is working in, in love of technology on open source. Um, we present with this uh, with this center some uh, ideas of the transgenic of mice with the Monsanto stuff that are happening in Oaxaca. Uh, this is a, a sculpture we started to make there using the transgenics to keep it there and measure the activity with the transgenics and record in, into a plate. This is me have a given a speech on how to do your own technology at a kitchen. Uh, this is the last conference um, project I made there with Laura Belov from the University of Copenhagen. We're making this research together in biorobotics also. Um, the last thing I'm making with open source is DNA, uh, is not DNA, it's reconstru the same technology of DNA reconstruction to take in the CAT scans in open source in Python to reconstruct uh, the 3D skeletons from um, fossils, from CAT scan from fossils. It works. Open source is the truth. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And any questions? Yeah. Antibiotic resistance okay. to to make the genes work. Okay. 
create with the bacteria. We are looking for another uh, ways to keep the genes without using the uh, antibiotic resistance. But right now it's, it's not really possible. You can do it with some plants because the technology is not using antibiotic resistance. And you can do it with uh, mice and uh, some are team, but okay. not with bacteria. I was interested how They die. Yeah. There are the specific laboratory bacteria that actually go in outside. Oh, thank you. No, no, no. <laughs> to make an iGEM here, uh, the pixels, uh, all, all, the, all the network, we can make an iGEM together. And we, pr we, can present an, uh, we can present the an iGEM project at the MIT together as a whole network from different countries. So the thing here is actually in one set, we can uh, uh, reproduce the set many times. It's free. We can share it with anyone we want. Uh, we have uh, kids. Uh, th th we have the last two kids in Mexico. So every year they send new kits. It's like the Lego, um, how do you, uh, the Lego um, collections. Only one collection every year. So the best is to keep all the collections. But you can reply, replicate them many times. And you have uh, now we have 10,000 different col uh, genes in the university. And the idea is that we can make all these things together. We can learn together all the stuff together. Uh, we can realize the technology is really good or bad because we can be there and that's the idea the massification of science or the crowd science is to give the people the power to choose and 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 with the knowledge it, uh, that's that's a, a huge thing we ha we can do it and that's why i believe a lot in into the open source stuff yeah sure Yeah, actually, there are colors. There are uh, the, we call them uh, chassis, uh, bacteria, viruses, plants, mice. There are chassis when we can express the genes there, and there are a lot of open source protocol we develop in open wearware, by example. This is an open source protocol place when we can go there and we can download all the protocols to to start to improve them, um, and that's the idea. We we can try it. It's a uh, it's a thing. Sure. Yeah, that's the thing. Artema Ciencia and Artema Ciencia and 3D and 3D Jota makers, 3D makers. Uh, this is a private company owned by my my friends and I, and we are collaborating with the university now. Um, by example, Faculty of Sciences, Faculty of Philosophy, Industrial Design, I'm the contact. We are making arrangements to make collaboration between all these institutes between them. And now we found, uh, now th there is a new uh, institute called Complexity Center uh, at the university. And we are starting to work together also with, with us. So there is a lot of things uh, to research. That's why Artema Ciencia is, is doing there at the university. So we can bring projects back to Mexico also with the support of the university. Actually, Laura Belov is working with us now. Another question? I hope to see you there at the 2 o'clock at the Bix. We are going to do biophysics today. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I would like to introduce your next speaker, Kat Austin.
no signal. There cannot be any type of settings. Add to the Plug it in because sometimes it should work. Then the source. No problem. Yeah. Uh, this this for to do what? I got confused. <laughs> got the computer got no projector. Input one, okay, perfect. No, no, but it's here, it's here, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, okay. like this. Input. Input one, DDA, no? This is DDA. But did you mirror? It's not, it's not getting the input. I don't know. Oh no, it's finally. Yeah, wait, wait. It's there at least. <laughs> So I would like to introduce you with uh, Kat Austin. Uh, she's an interdisciplinary artist based in the uh, UK and Germany. Uh, she holds a doctoral degree and she is trained in environmental chemistry. And she's also a consultant uh, for environment and technology and mainly focusing on issues of water. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it's very nice to be here. Oh, no, I think I've broken my display again. Okay, right. 
We'll see if we can fight with technology and get through the talk. Um, thank you for having me, uh, and thank you for the introduction, Rasa. Um, it was, it was, I was thrilled, actually, to see the previous talks in this session because um, the points about sort of bringing art and science and interdisciplinarity together that um, Rasa and Margaret made in terms of uh, the environment, w it really resonates with my work. So... My passion is the environment, and particularly water in the aquatic environment, and that's what kind of has driven me um, in my work since forever. So I started out sort of environmental campaigning when I was nine years old, and I haven't stopped, really. Um, and this issue of... Um, of these large sort of global problems is something that really uh, is the motivator behind everything I do. And I see it, you know, the, the reason that we need this kind of multifaceted approach for uh, looking at environmental problems and why it's nice to have arts and sciences and everything else looking at them is because they're such complex systems. Um, and to me, that's, that's how I sort of conceive of of these issues is that they're a kind of complex system that we can understand very well with our brains um, and with our scientific methods and you know we can model them we can see them but we don't act on them and we don't make changes to our lives to address them because um, I think because we're not feeling them they're not something that we can perceive on a human scale, you know, so climate change, uh, we're, we're starting sadly to get to the point where in, with climate change we can actually perceive it, you know, we saw the the uh, glaciers retreating in Margaret's talk this morning and, you know, so it's something that we are starting to be able to see and feel but, um, but still we're not, you know, we're not engaging with it in, in a way that really kind of touches the heart somehow. So that's that's the kind of um, thing that I explore in my work, uh, is how we connect with complex systems that lie outside our immediate perception um, and how we uh, can play with kind of physical manifestations of our actions or, um, you know... Yeah, or constructing sort of technologies that engage in that. Uh, so it's very much kind kind of coming from an object-oriented, ontological kind of perspective of seeing if there are objects that have an agency on us that can help to uh, connect us to these these systems that lie beyond our immediate perception. Um, so I started out with my artistic work uh, making kinetic sculptures. Uh, and environmentally motivated ones uh, using um, found objects and recycled objects. And so this is one of my earlier uh, commissions, which was, um, yeah, playing on, on the kind of ecological ideas of um, fuel use and climate change uh, and repurposing materials. And so looking at the the human impact on the environment and the the kind of um, yeah behavioural kind kind of impacts on the environment and I went on to produce a series of quite sort of post apocalyptic bicycle themed artworks uh, which addressed that sort of idea. Um, but moving on from that, I wanted to talk to you about this piece, which is called "Not Waving," and um, this. So I, over the years, I've been quite interested in um, connected devices and Internet of Things from this uh, agency of objects kind of perspective. And, uh, you know, they, there are lots of different sort of uh, implications to that, including, you know, privacy and data ownership and, and so on, but, um, which I'd love to talk about, but I don't think I've got time. So I'm just going to talk about uh, our relation to the digital world that um, that is expressed in this piece. So this is an artwork that looks at climate change and our awareness of issues to do with water stress. So um, 
I've, yeah, I do quite a lot of work relating to water stress and water resilience. And this particular piece uh, is an interactive piece that kind of, it works on a similar principle to, uh, to the Guillermo uh, Vargas piece that uh, Nora mentioned yesterday in her talk. She was talking about the, the starved dog that he put into a gallery in Rio and put uh, food just outside of reach. And she said in her talk yesterday, you know, people had the ability to move the food closer to the dog, but what they actually did was say, he's a monster, what's he doing tormenting this poor dog, you know? So it's a similar principle in this work, which is, it, it's a kind of, uh, you know, doom-laden piece where you have these um, micro people who I'm obscuring with my head, like some kind of giant. Um, <laughs> these micro people floating on uh, icebergs in a bath. And so this, this theme of kind of the familiar object is something that I tried to incorporate in my work to, to bring it all back to, you know, us and our actions. And that's not to say, and I, I, really, I really don't want to imply that the world's problems can be solved by individual action alone. I really don't believe that. It has to be a, like a cross-sectoral um, activity that but, um, there is too much onus put on the individual generally uh, when we have to address these problems. So it's not to say that, but the, but I, I suppose the idea behind this work is the, the bringing home of the implications of our, our own actions in a global context. So, so you have the, the micro people, they live on icebergs in a bath, and above them is this uh, hot water urn, uh, which every 10 minutes will dump water onto the icebergs and knock the people off into the water. Um, in fact, I've got a video, which I'll show you in a second. But the, the hot water urn is controlled by a Twitter uh, API query uh, for water. So if enough people are talking about water, uh, the target being 50 people every 10 minutes, then the hot water doesn't come out and destroy the icebergs. That's the idea. Um, and so there's a kind of, there's a double narrative here. Because if the hot water doesn't come out after the end of 10 minutes, it stores up and saves, and at the end of the, the pieces run, all the hot water comes out anyway, right? So the, the double narrative is that the only way to actually intervene and save the micro people, hashtag save the micro people, um, is to put your hand in, transcend these, these uh, normative barriers between the person and the artwork, which is obviously a <coughs> metaphor for the normative barriers in our general behaviors, and take the people out. I mean, you know, that's, that's all there is to it. So I'm going to try and get the video working, but I'm worried that I'm going to lose my... Um, lose my screen. So let's see. That's the one. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Yes, yeah, so as you see, you can tweet at it when it's in the, in the space. But every 10 minutes, that's going to happen. And, uh, and you get some, some little drowned micro people. I mean, I personally quite like the torment that you give to these little micro people. But um, oh, now I have to find my presentation again. Oh, sorry. I should have closed all these. <laughs> now I can't find it. Maybe it's on another... There we go. Okay, good. Um, ah, yeah, that was it. Showed the video. So, uh, in a similar vein, I did uh, this work, Flows, which... Um, so, Flows is in its second iteration. The first iteration was this map-based um, work which uh, allowed you to connect to 
digitally hosted narratives uh, using QR codes. So the concept behind the work is to look at the um, like the global production and supply lines that facilitate very, very mundane objects in our lives. So uh, you've got tea, strawberries, peanut butter, wine, pencils, and, and a guitar for like your luxury item, you know? Um, but they, they all have very interesting stories of uh, differing kind of um, global reach. And, you know, I you query the QR code on the map and it takes you through to the stories of the, the kind of the human level stories around the globe of what brought these objects to your, uh, to your vicinity. So that was iteration one. And iteration two was expanding on the, the narrative around tea. Tea is a really interesting and um, much loved often uh, beverage. And as a global um, product, it, it's very interesting because it doesn't get traded in quite the same way as many things. There's no futures market for tea. And so I started looking at the financial, um, the financial story behind tea, you know, where the, all the, the transactions happen and how does that get removed from the physical movement of the goods. And mapping it out, I mean, you see there are massive multinationals that are at play in the global tea trade and you see that there's um, sort of really interesting stuff happening at the different tea auctions with you know one per one group buying tea just to sell it on to another group that has a um, huge global tea enterprise um, and that kind of thing and it, it starts to kind of really show you um, not only the kind of financial network, but also the power network and the politics involved in this production of something that actually isn't very much appreciated when, when it's uh, engaged with on the user end. So Flows 2.0, Treading the Steep Route, was um, exhibited a month ago. Um, and it's again hot water boiler. I seem to be, uh, <laughs> I seem to be inadvertently getting uh, a little hot water boiler theme in my work at the moment. Um, it masqueraded as a refreshment stand, and you know you go and you make your cup of tea for yourself while you're moseying around in Palazzo Ducale, and when you do, you. Uh, hear the sounds of tea being traded around the world. And so that can be anything from uh, the tea pickers being paid in Sri Lanka or India or Kenya um, through to you know the accounts offices of where it's being packed, the distribution offices, out into the server rooms of the multinationals that convey the tea around the world. You know, so all of these little payments between subsidiaries of these sort of large global networks um, and then you know back down to what we understand uh, more of transactions which is someone buying it at the other end in a cafe or in a in a supermarket and what's really interesting f from my perspective is is that level of abstraction you know um, the abstraction away from the physical exchange um, of goods for money um, and the so going away into the server rooms you know but also interestingly the abstraction in terms of how we pay for things now generally in supermarkets where you're just you know you're exchanging f sort of digital money with a machine that beeps at you and yells at you to take your bags you know it's really so the 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 human element is even being kind of abstracted at the other final end um yeah so that's and obviously the reason for me the reason to engage with this was to look at you know um trying to trying to really understand the context of um of this 
convenient life that we have, not just in terms of, um, like broadly in terms of the environment, also in terms of human justice and the implications of that uh, in an environmental setting as well. So I'm um, going to switch again to a video. Just to, So this is um, a little clip just to give you an idea. It's taken in the studio. But if I, I'm not sure the sound's working. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, my computer got soaked in a bag a while ago, and the sound jack is a bit... Um, doesn't work that well. What you should be hearing is the sound of a, an auction in... Um, in India, I think it is, and what you hear is something along the lines of <laughs> that's what you're missing. <laughs> if you want to hear it, I'll, um, I'll, I'll show it to you later. <laughs> um, also, it's all, uh, a lot of the recordings are on SoundCloud. Uh, yes, which is a point that I wanted to make with uh, respect to what Christian was just saying, which is, yeah, I, I, the, the sharing of knowledge and of um, processes is like super important. So everything I do is open source, all the recordings are open source, all the designs for everything's open source as well. Um, uh, yeah, so in, in a slightly different non-hot uh, non water boiler theme, uh, I did some other work which was looking at um, like noise pollution and how sound can be used to put us in context with our environment. So uh, time slides and time slides fail was also an exploration into the idea of failing in public, which is something that's really important in terms of scientific research as well, because you know, there's not a lot of uh, publication of negative results, which is a problem in terms of wasted effort, you know. Um, and so I wanted to to bring that out in in my work as well. And so we ran...